the, uh, the, in, the alienated or infantile aspect of this relationship becomes apparent, and the emotion is suppressed. Is it, in other words, it's a stopping. Is it, in other words, it's a stopping of development, which is the way in which this emotion gets shut off. If I, is, it, is that what? The question is, is it early? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. When, yeah. when the parents actually send love to the kids. Oh, I see what your problem is, Bob. I got it for you. Your problem, I see what you're getting at. You're saying that the fundamental emotion, you're assuming that the fundamental emotion is homogeneous. It's not. It's not linear. It's not a homogeneous quality which you, you know, with a, with a coefficient, where you get more or less of the same quality. The emotion must necessarily change in internal quality as the child develops. The, emo the quality of this emotion is that it is a self-developing emotion. Self-developing. It isn't something that's the same all the time. The emotion, the character of the emotion is it is self-developing. It is not linear. It is not a magnitude, you know, an essence where you turn on the faucet and get so many ounces of it. It's a self-developing thing. It, it, it has the quality of life itself. It's self-subsisting, negentropic. Okay. <laughs> yes, next. Could you speak slower and uh, more distinctly? Louder. First, on the first thing, on the elation of actual discovery of an idea uh, is generally, I mean, you can generally say that is an expression of this fundamental emotion. It's not a direct expression of it, it's an indirect expression of it. It's the direct expression occurs in two cases. The direct expression uh, occurs uh, either in going at that is trying to get a referent directly for a negentropic conception of the type I've indicated, or in the emotion of loving, that is actual loving, which is a direct, which we might we call the infinite form of the emotion. That in any creative activity, that is the formation of new gestalts, by what we call reason, or what you might call intuitive reason, the formation of these gestalts is, is accompanied by emotion, which to the extent that that's what's involved is, is an expression of this fundamental emotion, the elation of discovery of new ideas, which is really an elation of an enlargement of the cognitive capacities of the mind as a whole, because you never really discover an isolated thing. Any discovery involves the entire cognitive processes of the mind. And the difficulty in, this, in answering something like that, in respect to a particular case, is that 
in the case in which the solution to a problem results in the anticipation of the infantile possession of an object, the very solution to the problem can become uh, the elation uh, of object possession. For example, let's take the chess player again, the poor unfortunate chess player, who sees a combination by which he is going to slaughter his opponent. It's very difficult in that case to determine exactly how much of the elation that may be due to a small amount of discovery and how much more of the elation may be uh, due to the possession of the opponent's pieces. There's less the kind of difficulty involved. One has to consider the, the actual situation to really judge whether this is, what this is. But in general, the, one can say safely that the emotion of discovery, uh, of discovery of new cognitive powers, is an experience of the fundamental emotion. Now, as to the problem of fantasy, there's only one criteria, and that's a revolutionary one. To the extent that one's efforts are directed to directly solving a problem of insight, that is, a creative insight, or to the extent that one's activity is creatively or cognitively related to the actual processes of the world, then that's not fantasy. Once, the best way to get at this conceptually, however, is, is perhaps not by someone discussing it, except to call your attention to the way to locate it in your own experience. It's not difficult, once you begin to get a certain amount of self-consciousness, to realize that you've flipped down into an ego state of fantasy. Uh, mind wandering is perhaps a term for it. What, it, what is difficult to do is to communicate to a person who's living in fantasy totally that they are in fantasy. For example, undoubtedly, most of the people who enter the acting profession are totally dominated by fantasy. Most people who have a professional involvement with English literature, for example, are totally dominated by fantasy. Because what, what is this whole business? plays, drama, so forth, it's pure fantasy. It's really patching up more fantasy material, you know, pe for, so people can masturbate better, because their old fantasies aren't, aren't working out. But the only way that one can directly know what is fantasy and what isn't is by comparing the two states, which is particularly perceptible when one's mind wanders and one finds that this wandering is destructive of the process to which one is committed, and then, in turn, looks back and, and sees where one's mind was wandering to. And then you begin to find out what is the underlying relationship. Why do, why do you go to that particular form of fantasy at that point? Then what does the fantasy conceal as a deeper fantasy, etc., etc.? So the real way to distinguish the distinction of reality from fantasy is a process. It starts from what might be called purely rational criteria. That is, what is a rational form of the individual's behavior in the interest of humanity as a whole? And in certain respects, that kind of decision is clear, and one can distinguish the state of mind in which that decision is made. Now, working outward from that to subordinated tasks, which otherwise it might be muddy, one can find where fantasy, fears, depression, etc., are interfering with performing tasks of which one should be intellectually capable. For example, anyone who can't study can find immediately the reason they can't study, they will find a fantasy which prevents them from creative, prevents them from getting into creative study. There's no such thing as a person who can't study. There's no such thing as a person who organically otherwise can't do intellectual work. If you examine what's going on in the person's mind, you will find that something happens whenever they try to study, whenever they try to do intellectual work you'll find some form of fantasy is either immediately on the surface of their mind or is buried. You'll find their mind wandering to certain things. And if you look underneath that with them, you begin to find out what their mind is wandering to. And you begin to uncover fantasy. So ultimately, the, uh, while we have certain clear indications of what is reality as opposed to unreality, that the ultimate test of uh, that is, the ultimate psychological truth from the standpoint of one's own self-knowledge is an ideological approach. That is, you examine your own pattern and begin to recognize how your witch behaves. I qualify this as I 
uh, did once before, is that in dealing with a witch and the, the assorted horrors of the pit, that one learns in working with people, one learns very quickly that these damn things have a pattern. They're just like a personality. And once you get the hang of them, you, be, you begin to recognize them. You, can, you find that you can recognize what the person is thinking simply by looking at them, because you recognize what the pattern is. Once you begin to recognize your own pattern, you can begin to smell the witch. You can smell her up to her tricks. And you can ferret out fantasies. The, the, see, the, as I say, just to end this, uh, the one problem of fantasy, of distinguishing fantasy states, among most people, they are not aware of the fantasy occurring. They are unconscious of the fantasy as an occurring fantasy. Their attention has to be called to the fantasy before they recognize that it's occurring. In many cases, not only are they unconscious of the superficial fantasy occurring, but the actual fantasy is buried much more deeply in the unconscious processes. And one would have to dig for that, and usually it comes out as a real horror. But once you find that horror, once you dig it out, smoke it out, get it in a cage, look at it, learn its tricks, then, then you know what the difference is between fantasy, because you know, you know how the damn thing works. You know what it's up to. Exactly the, that's exactly the uh, problem of continuity, which I was referring to, which I'm sure is what you're identifying. The best way to see it, without going into questions of, of different modes of, of thermodynamical processes, is to go backward from the uh, case of biological evolution species variation, and recognize that the same pattern occurs in the evolution of inorganic processes, so-called. There's a differentiation of different qualities in a certain relationship to one another. Th the third parameter is, uh, well, let's say a special kind of vector, to keep it as simple as possible. And the value of this vector is an exponential tendency, which is increasing in value, uh, for an increase in negentropy, which is negentropy. That is, an exponential tendency for the increase in simple negentropy, which is the notion of, not, of, of negentropy, which we're getting at. And the state of negentropy is the actualized effect of this tendency upon the whole universe, or the whole phase of the universe we're dealing with. Now, in animal species, or plant species, the increase, I use this one and work backward, the increase of one species, or the increase of a population of the species, or the introduction of a new species, means that more energy, in effect, is consumed from the entire process around it. But this is not merely consumed as raw energy, not as undifferentiated energy but it is consumed as negentropy. That is, it occurs in specific forms, like an animal will eat certain kinds of plants and animals and so forth. These must be present in a certain abundance or a certain mode of behavior which is characteristic of that animal, or of its technology, so to speak. Therefore, the precondition for the existence of this species in a certain density in population is initially a number of preconditions. These preconditions in themselves express uh, stratified, a stratified moment of negentropy. Now the question is this, does this increase in the population of the species under consideration result in an increase or decrease in the negentropy of the ecology of the biosphere as a whole? If it results in a diminution of the negentropy of the biosphere as a whole, then the proliferation of the particular array upon which this species depends 
there will be a diminution of this resource. Then the species itself will tend to contract through its reaction to the holistic reaction to the environment. Now, in inorganic processes, essentially the same thing occurs in the evolution of, of layers of what we might call roughly thermodynamical modes is that a process is feeding on an existent process or combinations of processes in the surrounding universe, or that phase of the universe. The question is, what is the effect of the process which is being maintained upon its in context? If the effect of the process is to increase the negentropy of the whole system, and the elements on which its existence is dependent themselves reflect increased negentropy, then it was going to tend to perpetuate itself up to the point that a further differentiation is required, that is, a new species to complement it, etc., a new process, to bring the whole thing back and keep the process of negentropy going. In a crude way, that describes exactly what the problem is of conceptualizing a unified field, is that we start from a certain level of actualized negentropy. At that point, we can conceptualize the introduction of a new process, a, sp a special quality of process, out of these preconditions, which represent negentropy. If this process represents a, a mediation for the further increase of negentropy, the initial effect is to tend to reinforce its own existence and amplify its own existence. However, it's not so simple because its expansion ex itself alters the structure and thus tends to demand a complementary differentiation which supersedes it. Thus, we can say that the the complexity of systems in terms of their apparent number of modes, their apparent number of kinds of discrete events, that this, this complexity of the system will tend to increase in its particularities with respect to an increase in negentropy. Thus, the, since, since the whole system only connects in the way I've described it, when we consider this to, for simple simplified terms, this vector of this exponential tendency for increase in simple negentropy. When we consider that, the whole system connects and becomes self-subsisting. And every feature which would be determined by the two preceding conditions is automatically subsumed as a predicate of this notion of negentropy. Therefore, once you've gotten to the third by these two preceding approximations, you no longer need the previous two. Therefore, the third now accounts for every phenomenon which you previously would have accounted for in the other two phenomena. Yeah. 
Well, take, let's take the second one first because it is shorter. No, the object, the object of analysis is not to make you healthy by your going back to uh, somehow improve the family models on which you base your capacity for function. That the relationship to the existent parents, for example, or settling accounts with the memory of the existent parents is essentially a matter of understanding yourself in part and is also getting the garbage out of you. That is, you, you are establishing a human relationship with existent human beings and thus freeing yourself of the crap of having an erotic relationship to existent human beings. In other words, the, rela the relationship of the adult person to its parents is not one of need for their I giving him identity, etc. The relationship to the adult parents uh, is simply a matter of having human relationships wherever you have relationships, whether they're actual relationships with existent people or whether they're your understanding of your past relationships with existent persons. It's simply a sanitary thing. Now, apart from its analytical significance. The, um, the pathetic thing, the ultimate form of ideology, or let me back off and explain it this way. People will say to me, well, gee, you know, I saw my father, I saw my mother, I talked to them, uh, we now have a more human relationship, but gee, my father's still a failure and my mother's still somewhat of a sadist and a dummy. With a, with a father who's a failure and a mother who's a dummy, how can you expect me to do anything? That is a sort of a hereditarian genetic kind of nonsense, which is really a real fraud. This is the real ultimate rationalization. Since my father is, is, is not well educated and my mother is something or other, uh, therefore, um, what can you expect me to do? Blaming their parents for what they should do with their existing gifts. The basic ne neurotic gimmick is saying, I am able to do nothing except as my parents and other people in this pit give me the sense of identity for doing it. The function of analytical development, at least in our context, is to free oneself from all of that crap. That what you're capable of doing has nothing to do with what your father or mother were capable of doing, or not doing, or whether they had athletes for it, or whatever it was. This has nothing to do with your responsibility. Your relationship to them, analytically, is first of all clearing up, analytically, your past relationship to them. And secondly, is, is they are also human beings with whom you have close personal ties, of one's past or present. Therefore, you want a human relationship with them, whatever they are. Yeah? But that's completely independent, except as a sanitary thing, from the fundamental task, which is to free oneself from any sense that what you're able to do has anything to do with what your parents did or didn't do. Yeah? Right. Now, the other thing. Self-consciousness is normally accessed, as I said, from the ego, is that when you're being self-conscious, you're not really being self-conscious in the sense of locating your sense of identity in self-consciousness. You're locating your sense of I, and Feuerbach says this. The I is located in the ego, the thou is the other, that's self-consciousness. And you, you use self-consciousness as a mirror in which the ego can see itself. Therefore, the ego becomes more intelligent. Now, how does the witch come in on this? Well, if you've got a good mother image, you know, sort of a good witch, the, not the Wicked Witch of the West type, but the good witch type. Then the good witch lets you get mana, a sense of elation, from being, uh, having favorable uh, intercourse, and I don't mean necessarily sexual intercourse, but favorable intercourse in general, with, with people. So that the young radical gets into a mass upsurge finds that certain ideas which correspond to reason, self-consciousness, that these ideas are associated with activities in which a larger number of people are viewing his activities favorably. Oh, gee, a bunch of workers think we're pretty good people. And they associate, I associate what I do that the workers like before with my being reasonable. In that sense, the importance of the mirror has increased as a determinant in judging mediating but you, what you'll do in, but you always refer first of all check with mummy you don't you, you're self-conscious yeah you look at the mirror 
of self-consciousness to determine what reason says you ought to do. But before you actually do it, check with mommy. And she says it's okay, fine. With the mother image. And that's the way it works. Now, what they find is immediate opinion attenuates. Workers aren't around patting you on the back anymore. Oh, well, I didn't work. So that the fact that there is an ebb as a result of the experience itself indicates that this was done in the ego state all along. Because if the I was located or had been shifted to self-consciousness, the fact that you had one such experience would be treated by reason as a scientific vindication of the method by which you got to that experience. And the attenuation of the experience would not be, would not be an ebb in your consciousness, but would be recognized by you as only an ebb in the situation. Right? And that's, that's the phenomenon we're dealing with. We're dealing in the Labor Committee with people who are essentially, most of them, are essentially in an ego state, who are distinguished from, say, uh, such imbeciles as SW peers. They're distinguished by the fact that they're using the mirror of self-consciousness, that is, active reason, to guide their behavior. They generally have to settle accounts with what they feel able to do by arguing out the rightness of doing this with the internalized mother image. But in, the, uh, in, the, in reality, there would be no need for this. Now, the same thing is true in the workers. But in a real workers' movement, where the seizure of power is the goal, this changes. It actually does produce self-consciousness. Maybe not the strongest kind of self-consciousness, but it does. And that's something I'll get to later, but I'll just identify it now. Is that the image of the father in religion is not the image of the existent father. It's the image of Nelson Rockefeller. That is, religion and the family regard the existent father, if he's a worker or something, they regard him as a poor schlep, who maybe is a good provider, but he's a schlep. The real man, in the image of the cuckold uh, unlike the typical worker who is in Catholic theology, of course, is associated with a cuckold, uh, St. Joseph, the guy who stood outside the door while the angel Gabriel blew his horn on the Virgin Mary. <laughs> the real father is Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, the guy who blows the horn. <laughs> Who's he? Is he the worker? No, he's not the worker. He's Nelson Rockefeller. He's the angel Gabriel. He represents potency in the outside world. The figure that has control of the lawful order of reality outside the family life itself. Well, the worker really becomes self-conscious when he decides this bass has got to go. Not we're going to make demands of Nelson. Not we're going to demand that the Congress get rid of Nixon but we're going to demand that Congress pack Nixon in his bag and leave. When that, when that kind of determination is made, that's a shift to self-consciousness because the worker at that point has made a self-conscious decision. He said, I take responsibility for the worldwide existence and development of the human race. That's the precondition of self-consciousness. The characteristic of self-consciousness is hubris which says, I don't give a good goddamn what anybody thinks. I'm going to do, fulfill my responsibility to the future of the human race. And that's what I'll do. If I'm absolutely alone, I'll do that. That's self-consciousness. So what the... Just one second. Is that self-consciousness that needs to be delaying something, cause you to stop looking at the way you're changing the world around you and start looking at apparent changes which are going on entirely inside. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's, like, it's like the Operation Mop-Up thing. What psych people out in Operation Mop-Up? A few bruises? No, the Communist Party's been passing out bruises for years. The Communist Party goon squads have been dishing out bruises all over the left for years. The SWP has been dishing out bruises in recent years, using goons. It's been going on all over the place. The cops do it all the time. The liberals order it done all the time. I mean, you can imagine the Columbia administration being upset about little, you know, a little few bruises with what the blood that they've ordered. 
No, this is that's nonsense. What upset people? It's the key to self-consciousness. What upset people is that the fixed order of reality in which the Communist Party had to be an existent institution on the left as its major fixture, that this thing, we're saying, we're going to end that. We're going to change reality. We are expressing potency. And people, in their own words, got freaked out by that. They were freaked out. They were freaked out by the fundamental, what's the first commandment? What's the first commandment? Uh, written by this guy Ezra in the year uh, 558 BC, I think it was. That's right. There shall be no other cause before me. And they got a story that goes along with that about how Lucifer got kicked out, you know. But that ain't true. Lucifer's really Karl Marx, and he's coming. They just hope, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Okay, well, it's very simple. Freedom and necessity. Say, well, if you don't do this, you're going to die. That sounds like mother if you, saying, if you don't do this, you're not going to get your supper tonight. Right? Telling a worker he's going he's to die if he doesn't do, make a revolution. He doesn't know what a revolution is. The, the essential thing, the necessity is clear. See, the worker really knows about the necessity. He has the uh, existent knowledge, which he hasn't put together. He's seen food prices. He's now heard about the energy crisis. He's heard about all kinds of things. He's told the world is going to pieces. There's a disaster. It's a question of how many minutes he's going to have his job and so forth. He knows all about disaster. All the motivation and necessity for doing something is very clearly there. But he's, he's inert. He's dumb. He's numb. Well, somehow it'll work out. Somehow it'll work out. Well, that's pure magic. He believes in magic. God is going to intervene, or maybe those flying saucers are going to come down and save us. Or maybe they'll deliver groceries by flying saucer, you know, it's cheaper. Anything would be cheaper than the ENP. What he lacks is the other. So when you're really confronting a worker, you're not confronting him when you're, when you're attacking him about you've got to make a revolution, it's going to be a disaster. That is, that is merely a necessary qualification of the evidence which you're putting together for. And that's merely a predicate of the process. Well, you really confront the workers the same way the mop-up confrontation involves a confrontation. You tell them he has the ability to do it. Now, well, how do you define his ability? You have to discuss with him the process of organizing. Because what's he going to say? Well, how many people we got in the organization now? You say, oh, maybe a few hundred. Ah, I don't think we'll make it. So that you're, you haven't, if you tell somebody to join Neuro, now on the basis of we got to make a revolution, you really haven't said anything to him yet. You've said something which is true, at least it's formally true, and absolutely true, but you haven't communicated to anything inside him which makes that a positive conception. You say, look, first of all, fact one. If there isn't a socialist transformation in the next five years or so, there ain't going to be no human race. That's fact number one. Now, there's nothing around right now which is organized and has the strength to do it. Now, you know the other workers around here. They're pretty bad, aren't they? They're pretty backward. You say, of course. Catch them up like me. <laughs> well, see, what we've got to do is what we need obviously is a handful of people who will stop the organizing process so we can get this organizing process going at a rapid enough rate on a large enough scale so that we can begin to organize a sufficient mass. Now, if you cop out, you son of a bitch, 
then we've lost the dike here because you're maybe one out of 500 or 10,000 who is ready now able to make this step. If you cop out and more people in your situation cop out, then we'll never get the 10,000. Therefore, if you make the decision to cop out now, you're selling out the human race right now. That's the way you present it to him. You present it to him by presenting the process in which he is a vital element. You go up to some guy and say, look, we need another rank and filer for the revolution. He says, well, how many rank and filers you got now? <laughs> you recruit that guy when you show him. And that doesn't mean one meeting with a fast pitch. That means going back and back and back and bringing the guy along until he's up to the point that he understands enough to make a commitment. It means sustained organizing, not emergency mobilizations to go out and meet your contacts once every six months. I mean, once a, once a three-month contact uh, rampage, doesn't do a damn thing. But the next time you see the guy, he's forgotten everything you said to him the first time. His consistent work. You show the guy that he himself has something extraordinary inside him, that he's not a rank and filer. We get, we get this damn kind of thing, for example, example of Neuro is a good example. We get this sense that Neuro is somehow a different organization, different from the labor committees, which is parallel to the labor committees like a broader organization, which is a lot of crap. It's a lot of crap that Neuro is a separate organization of the labor committee. It is in only one sense. Only in the sense that there are a lot of workers who are not ready to make a commitment to the labor committee. And therefore, if you want to do something with them, even organizing, you have to allow them to function on a basis of reduced level of commitment. So they don't have to sign, they can only sign away two arms, they don't have to go throw their torso and legs in. That's essentially what it is. It's the same thing with RIM. RIM is a somewhat different proposition. These young kids have to go through a somewhat different process of development teenage kids. But it's the same kind of process. The way you recruit somebody is by not by telling them that they're a good rank and filer is necessary for the revolution. The way you recruit somebody at this stage is obvious. You want to recruit rank and filers? Well, you've got a big strike on your hands and you've got to get everybody out. Well, you've got a big force and you say everybody out. Then you get rank and file. Or when you want to make a revolution? Well, you want everybody out for that. You know? No, this is not the day to go fishing. We're making the revolution today. But otherwise, you recruit, particularly at this stage, only to the extent that you show the individual that that individual has something exceptional. That does not mean going down the street and saying, here's a guy. Hey, you know you've got something exceptional about you? No, this doesn't mean that at all. Because he may not be exceptional. <laughs> Chances are, what, are 9,999 out of 10,000 that he's not exceptional. Not in that sense. You have to find the exceptional person. How do we find exceptional people? There's a process we, by which we know that somebody standing up in front of us is actually an exceptional person and should be told this. This should not be kept secret from him any longer. What's the process? We distribute. Out of our distributions, eventually, if you do it in a sustained way, so many guys respond. Okay, you've got a certain number of people. You begin talking to them. Then you find so-and-so is a well-meaning dumbhead. So-and-so is good, but his problem is too acute. Uh, So-and-so has 15 children and two wives. Not exactly in the best shape. And in that process, you get down to one or two people out of a whole area of work who you realize are really exceptional people. You realize that they're intellectuals. And of course, students sometimes have trouble recognizing that a worker who's not well-educated, particularly, can be an intellectual a real part of the intelligentsia. If you listen, you can hear that. You can, you can hear the guy whose mind actually works conceptually, who's fascinated by process, who's fascinated by kinds of things, and whose mind is constantly working, working. He's frustrated at the stupidity of people around him. You find such a person, you say, look, don't you realize what your problem is? Don't you realize why you feel like the black chick, like the ugly duckling in this mess? Because you're different. You're a revolutionary. And you're never going to be at peace until you, until you make that commitment. And here's why you've got to do it. And here's how we're going to do it. That's the way you do it. That's self-consciousness. That's confronting someone. Confronting them with the truth about themselves and their situation. 
but it has to be the truth. And it takes a little time to get the truth across. Lies you can get across immediately. Truth takes a little longer. Are there further questions, comments? Okay. Well, I haven't been in some of these writings on the But there's, there's the idea first. And through a process of evolution, according to the idea of the middle and then the vegetable life of the galaxy of man, where the idea becomes conscious of itself. And similar things, like when I was reading what you said, the Beyonce analysis about construction of poetry, out of yourself. I get a sense of something really being created. And it seems like to me, in my presence now, that something to be created out now, that's the way, that's the way I'm on it. That's the way it comes down to me. And I don't want to believe, you know, in this magic, and I don't feel like it's real magic. But everything I see, I can only conceptualize as like a friend of, of this megatropic tendency. And then the negative tendency is still like God, still like this. Okay. Very beautiful. It's beautiful because that's exactly the way the problem poses itself to most people. Metaphor Feuerbach referred to that. Feuerbach refers to that. That's one of Feuerbach's perceptions is to understand that aspect of the problem. The there is no idea. Spinoza was ahead of, of Hegel in this respect. Spinoza recognized that the form, that is the creative principle, and the substance were one and the same thing. That creativity is not a quality of substance, that creativity and substance are one and the same thing. And that when we say that particularities are a predicate of substance, we are saying that, this, that exactly that, that particularities are a predicate of substance. That the materiality of the universe is not, see, the difference is this. The conception of materiality, of corporeality, is of things which are made up of packets of quanta of energy, as a homogeneous linear quanta, energy, simple scalar. Right? But we reverse this relationship, that we say that quanta exist but only as predicates. They're only aspects, momentary aspects of a process. It is the process itself which is substance. Now, and this is what Feuerbach recognized. Feuerbach did two things, one of which was half legitimate, one of which was fraudulent. Half legitimately, he recognized that Hegel's, Hegel's understanding of the Logos is one of the same thing. And in that respect, he said that unless one oneself is able to reflect the understanding in this form, then the understanding must appear to one as nothing that the absolute, that is, that which is all, that which is primitive, appears as nothing. And that's exactly what the problem is. And the problem is, is that, first of all, to have a positive conception of something, one must be able to reach into one's own mental processes and find a referent which corresponds to empirical demonstration of the existence of that thing in reality. That is, no matter how many times and how many ways one demonstrates empirically the existence of this primitive self, neg this negantropic self-subsisting positive, that unless the individuals who are hearing this demonstration and seeing it have a referent in their mental processes which corresponds to this in form, then they cannot positively conceptualize what they're experiencing. They cannot integrate. They can only retain a circumferential knowledge of its existence, which is circumferential knowledge of all the details of the empirical demonstration. But then when they try to get at, directly at, what they, was it within the circumference, they can't get in it. Because they, they can't go in the circle, therefore the circle seems empty to them because they can't get into it. And that's exactly what the problem is. It, the, the appearance of nothingness is the inability to deliberately access the fundamental emotion as a referent for the empirical evidence of continuity. And thus the function of dealing with this problem is to locate and enable people to systematically overcome, because you can't do it overnight. It's a, it's a growing process, a developing process, to systematically overcome the neurotic obstacles, or it bores or ideological obstacles in more specifically, which prevent one from getting direct access to the emotion. Once you get direct access in a self-conscious way to that emotion, then the referent exists 
for conceptualizing these kinds of process